All right, turn with me your Bibles to uh, John chapter 20. We're going to start a new series today. Um, my plan is for it to be a short one, just the month of uh, January. But just some things the Lord's laid on my heart. I, I, uh, have a, I have a whole bunch of sermons already in my heart, in my mind. I don't know, this has never happened to me before. And um, they're going to kind of fall in in an order. One will build upon the other. So I hope you will uh, be here to try to digest what God is wanting us to know about this year as we start a new year, a new beginning. And um, if you miss one and you want to go back and kind of listen to that, the guys will make you a copy, I'm sure. And, or you can go on our website and hear it there. But um, I, I've just been feeling like God is really wanting us to to just kind of hone in uh, on the strength of His Word, what He's trying to tell us, what He's needing us to know uh, as these days approach that are obviously going to be very challenging, it looks like. Uh, maybe the, the return of the Lord is, is soon, we, we don't know. But I just have this feeling we need to be moving in a direction. And so that's what I'm going to attempt to do and it's <laughs> for the next several, several weeks. And, uh, but I wanted to start with this short series called New Beginnings because there are about four things that, that I think we need to, foundational things we need to get a hold of to begin to start here and build. And so the first one today is I'm calling New Beginnings Salvation. And so we're going to go back to John chapter 20. You know, we read the Bible so much of the time and we think, Okay, well, you know, the, the, the New Testament starts at the beginning of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's where the Gospels are. The Gospels start there, and that's New Testament. That's New Covenant stuff, but it's really not. It's really not. Most all of that time in the Gospels was still under the Old Testament law, was still under the Old Covenant. It wasn't until the cross that the New Covenant really kicked in. And we're about to look at that, those first moments after the resurrection when when everything changes. Now, we, we've been living in this world uh, since that changed all of our lives, but these guys, they hadn't. This was a, a new beginning for them. And if we go get a hold of what's being said here, I believe it will be a new beginning for us as well. I put a, uh, just a four-point outline there in your bulletin just to kind of help you get a hold of it as we go through. The first, the first thing we're going to look at is um, Roman numeral number one there, just being there. We're going to start, I'm just going to read a few verses in, in um, John chapter 20 to try to kind of set this up. This is resurrection morning. Uh, this, is, this is after Jesus had just risen from the dead. Mary has gone to the tomb, if you, if you remember that story. I hope you all know that story because I'm kind of banking on that so I don't read the whole, whole thing. But she goes to the, she goes to the tomb and, and she sees the empty tomb. And, and she sees these angels and she gets this story and, and she runs back to tell Peter and John about it. And of course you know the story, they run back with her and they run into the tomb and they find it empty as well. And, and so they, they're, they're looking there and, and we read this in verse 10. And so the disciples went away again to their homes. In other words, they saw something actually the absence of something, but they didn't see the whole deal yet. And so these two guys, these two fellas, they went on back home. Puzzled, I'm sure, but Mary, Mary stayed. Here's what we read in verse 11. But Mary. I like that. But Mary. In other words, there's something different about Mary. So let's read and see what happened with Mary, starting in verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Now let me just say this before we get any further, because you're going to see this again and again in this story. There's something different about the resurrection body. We don't know what it is. We could do a lot of guessing, but we know that she saw him and didn't exactly recognize him. 
The disciples in a little while are going to see him and not completely recognize him. The, the two on a, the road to Emmaus, remember, they saw him and did not completely recognize him. And so there's something different about that resurrected body. We're not sure what that is, but we just need to understand that it's the same Jesus, uh, resurrected body, but he looks a little bit different. So much so that his own friends didn't recognize him <coughs> Excuse me, right away. And so he had to do things to make them recognize him. Where would I stop at, guys? All right, 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. I wonder how many times he'd said that word in that way. She may not have recognized his looks, but she recognized that voice calling her name. He says, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. <clears throat> You know, this is an amazing story if we know Jew Jewish history at all because the first century Jewish rabbis had a saying. They taught this. They said, they said, it is better that the words of the law be burned than be entrusted to a woman. I'm sorry, ladies, but that's the way it was back then, but not with Jesus because what does Jesus do? He goes first to Mary, a woman. And he gives her this very important message. You know who the very first missionary in the whole Bible was? Mary. The first missionary, the first person to take the gospel truth of the resurrected Lord to anyone was a woman. And her name was Mary. And she had the complete gospel story for the first time. And you know what that complete gospel story was? It was the story of salvation. And that's what we want to look at today. Why was it the story of salvation? Why was, was she able to carry that message? Listen to me, this is so important to us. We'll skip over this if we don't really pay attention. It was she got that message because she was there. Remember, the other two left. But Mary was there to witness a move of God. I wonder how many times we miss a move of God because we fail to position ourselves to be there when God is going to move. You ever think about that? When God is moving. Back in the 90s, our family was a part of a church, just an absolutely awesome church. Now what made it so awesome was it was just spirit-filled. I mean, it was, you, you just, you, everybody walked in there, just all of a sudden you knew that the Holy Spirit was all over that place. And, and I remember people talking about it over and over and over. And we talked about it in our family. You never wanted to miss a Sunday because you knew if you miss a Sunday, you're going to miss a move of God. It's a given. It's a guarantee. God is going to move every single Sunday, and He did. And if you're not there, you'll miss the move of God. I wonder how many times, because we don't position ourselves, maybe through some gathering of the saints or some... Uh, seminar or some something where, where God is likely to show up. How many times does somebody else witness a move of God but we miss that move of God because we're not there? How many of our own people are kind of hit and miss in worship? Here one week, gone the next, maybe two, and, and they're missing opportunities for a move of God. You know, a move of God well, you might look around and say, Ooh, well, that, 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 it just everybody will get a hold of that. Not necessarily. God might move on you. You might be the only one this morning, but you might be in a position where the Word of God is being taught and all of a sudden God is able to move in on you. We need to always try to position ourselves in, in case God is going to move. We don't want to miss it. We're going to see in just a moment the day that Jesus showed up, but Thomas was missing. And you know what he missed? <laughs> he missed the move of God. Just because he was missing. He wasn't present. He was AWOL that day. So the second point I want you to see is what I've called peace with you. Look at verse 
19. This is where we kind of get into our story. The rest of that was just kind of a setup. So when it was evening on that day, this is resurrection day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, think about this for a moment. Based on the last three days, you know the story. You know the story of the disciples and what went on in the garden that night and what went on during the crucifixion and what's gone on for three days since then. Jesus, his first words to these guys could have been a lot different. He could have said a lot of other things. He could have come into that room and said, busted, all of you. You're busted. He could have said, where were you when I needed you? He could have said, while I was enduring those fake trials and that terrible cross, all of you guys were hiding. All of you guys were pretending you didn't even know me. But you know what? That is so far from the greeting that Jesus brought. That wasn't what he was thinking at all. The, the, the greeting that Jesus offered was one of peace be with you. We're going to see this three times in this one short passage here. This is, it is so important. Here's why. Because true peace, true peace only comes with true salvation. True peace only comes with true salvation. Let me show you how, how we know that. Look here in your, Bible, in your uh, bulletin. We, we learned back there at the beginning of this story about Jesus coming to earth. Luke 2.14. The, the um, shepherds were on the hillside one night and some angels showed up and, and, and here's what they began to say. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Peace. He offered, those angels offered peace from God, but who? To, to those men whom God was pleased with. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be pleasing to God? Well, we read about it in Hebrews eleven six. 6. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So what does it mean to have peace with God? It means to have faith in God. It's for those who believe in God. It's about faith. So I want you to watch this in verse 20 now. Based on that, watch this. And so Jesus said to him, here it is again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. I want you to know, this is the moment that we're about to see. The moment when Jesus is about to show them the signs of his resurrection. Verse 20, did I read the wrong verse? I did. Verse 20, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Remember what I told you a minute ago? He didn't look the same. He walked. He comes into that room. I don't know if he walked in, dropped in, slid in. I don't know how he did it. It was locked doors, but he showed up in that room. And they probably looked at him, and for just a second, they were probably thinking, I'm not sure who this is. I mean, he doesn't look the same. So you know what he does? He shows them his hands, the holes in his hands, even the resurrected body of Jesus still has the holes. You know, there won't be anything in heaven that is man-made except those holes. Those holes in the, the, the hands and the side and the feet of Jesus, they're man-made. They'll be in heaven all of our lives, all of our eternity. Jesus' is resurrected body. And so Jesus shows them the signs of who He is. You know what these are signs of? These are signs of the completed salvation package. The disciples had already been followers of Christ, but they had not yet been regenerated. In other words, they had not yet been born again. Why is that? Because prior to the last three days, Jesus had not yet died to redeem them from their sins. See, this all has to happen in order. The, the death has to happen first, then the burial, then the resurrection, and then as we're about to see, the rest of the package. 
but it comes in that order. And they had not yet been born again, but this was their moment. This was their moment of true salvation. Yes, they had been followers, but they had not been saved until this moment. Some have asked probably, well, what, is the, what is the most important single event in all of history? You know what? I say it has to be the resurrection. It has to be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of human history, all of eternity is either nullified or verified by the event that happened three days after the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection. The resurrection is the validity. It makes valid His sacrificial offering on the cross. It's the resurrection that proved that He was God and He is God forevermore. Human history and all of eternity is about the God of heaven becoming man, coming to earth in order to save sinful man and provide him with eternal life. Here Jesus is saying, look and see. I'm the same one who died on the cross. I'm the same one who went into the grave. I'm the same one who conquered sin, death, hell in the grave on your behalf. Is showing once for all, I'm the same God that came out of that grave, was resurrected from the dead. Now look at my hands and my sides and believe. You see, it's our faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ that assures our peace with God that comes through our salvation. I don't miss this. In this moment, everything changed for these guys. You see, up until this moment, the disciples, again, had been living under the old law, the old covenant. Now, all of a sudden, they can be born again. Church, we don't ever need to take being born again for granted. You know, wake up every day and be amazed that the God of the universe would send His Son, die in my place, a stinking sinner that had absolutely no deserving of this, and bring me into the family. That needs to be special every day. Why were they able to be born again? Because now the cross had happened. Now the grave had happened. Now the resurrection had happened. But this moment, before this moment, sin had only been covered. For all of these years of of human history, sin had been covered, but it had only been covered. You see, the the blood of rams and and goats and, and bulls and sheep, they could only cover sin. But that blood could never cleanse sin. That blood could never remove sin. It could never redeem someone from sin. You see, only the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from our sins. And now after the cross, that shedding the blood, the saving blood of Jesus had been accomplished. And those saints who died before the cross... Guess what? They were saved the same way we are. They were just saved on credit. In other words, they were looking forward to a cross, but they still believed in the same Jesus. They still believed in the same redemption. They still believed in the the shed blood. It was talked about all through the Old Testament. And so they they were still saved by the cross of Christ and His shed blood for our redemption. And the new covenant which begins right here, really, it it begins the blessings of being born again. The blessings of being made new. And we're about to see the blessings of receiving the Holy Spirit of God Almighty to come and live and dwell inside of us. This is all new. This was a magic moment. Except it wasn't magic. It was supernatural. And that's what happens in our lives too. The third point is saved to sin. Saved to sin, not sin, sin, the S-E-N-D. Look at verse 21. 
And so Jesus said to him, Peace be with you. There it is again. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. In other words, what God sent me here to do, I'm sending you to do. You are saved. Some people say sometimes, I wonder why we got saved and didn't get taken back up to heaven right away. I mean, we're not ever going to be more saved than we are in that moment of salvation, right? All right, church? Okay, this is not a progressive thing. You're saved in that moment, and you're just as saved as you'll ever be. So why did he leave us here? He left us here to send us. And we'll, we'll see what that means a moment, in a moment. He repeats that, peace be with you. I want you to know that's a, that's a salvation theme. Peace and salvation go hand in hand. There's another thing, saved to sin. Saved to send us out into the world. So how did they, how did they re- receive the Holy Spirit? Here's what we say. Well, here's what we, what we know. Verse 22, when he said this, he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to know something. Jesus Christ who is both the Redeemer and the Creator, breathed on them. The same thing happened during the creation, the first time life happened. Here's what we read in Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust to the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. You see that? God breathed into Adam the breath of life. That word there, translated breath, whether you look it up in the Greek or the Hebrew, it means both means the same thing. You know what it means? It means spirit. So Jesus breathed the spirit of life into these men there in the upper room. And it resulted in their salvation. You see, up to now, They had had the Holy Spirit residing with them as far as with Jesus. There's an indwelling of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised back in John 14. He said it was going to come. Here's what we read. And I'll ask the Father, and He'll give you another helper that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him. Because he abides with you, and he will be with you. So he was already abiding with them. That was an old covenant way. He was abiding with them. But look look again at what it says there in verse 17. It says, the world cannot receive him. You know, there's a lot of things different about the church and the the unchurched, or the unsaved. The saved and the the unsaved. You know what one of the major, really the major part is, other than our salvation? is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in everybody. He's not been made available to everybody. This is the world. Can't, you, they can't even receive Him. But you can. Why? Because of faith. Because of faith. Here's, here's what we read. If you flip over a page to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says, gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait, wait for what the Father has promised. Remember, we just read about that. Which he said, you you heard it from me. We heard it back there in John chapter 14. For John the Baptist baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Skip down to verse 8. When that happens, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be sent. You will go out into all parts of the world and you will be sent. You see, see what what we know is that the power of the Holy Spirit would come on them. That is, at this moment, they had the Holy Spirit in that upper room, but the Holy Spirit didn't yet have them. Not completely. They had the Spirit, but the Spirit didn't have them. But I'm going to tell you something. We just read here, this is about to change in just a few more days. At Pentecost, there's going to be another very spectacular move of God. And I bet they're glad they didn't miss that one. 
But you know what? You know what the Bible tells us? It tells us that Jesus rose from the dead. He goes to these guys. He shows himself to them, Mary, a few other women. And then the Bible says, and a little bit later, he showed himself to 500 people. The resurrected Lord, still on the earth. 500 people saw the resurrected Lord still on the earth. That's good, right? Till you get to the day of Pentecost. You know what the day of Pentecost tells us? There were 120 people in the room. I'm thinking, where's the other 380? They've seen the resurrected Lord, but they're not gathered with the saints when a move of God is about to happen. You know what? It looks just like church today. Two-thirds, three-fourths of them were somewhere else when God showed up with the, one of the greatest moves in all of history. Where were the other 380? Let me tell you something, church. We don't want to be part of the 380s. Seeing the resurrected Lord, know about the resurrected Lord, believe in the resurrected Lord, but we are not there when, when the move of God happens. Thomas is about to experience some of that himself. So the believers indwell with the Holy Spirit at the moment that they believe. But this is not the same thing as the filling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling is a one-time event that happens at the moment of salvation, but the filling of the Holy Spirit happens again and again. And it's really a very intentional act. It's actually a command. What it means, the word there, the, the filling actually means to be controlled by. And we know it's different to be indwelled by or controlled by. Controlled by requires an act of submission. I pray for this every day, that I will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You know, the best way to keep away from sin is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't mess with sin. If you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, it keeps you away from that. So I pray for the controlling of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's why we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not commanded to be indwelled. That's part of the salvation experience. But we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's, what, here's where we see it, Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Don't you hate it when you dissipate? But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means to be controlled by not the influence of alcohol and all that comes with that. We know that that does influence people. But be influenced by, controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. This understanding is the reason I bring this up. It is very important in light of the next verse that we're about to read. A little bit confusing verse, but we're about to read verse 23. So let's read it. Here's what we read. If you, remember he's just told you, receive the Holy Spirit. Next words, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Boy, that sounds complicated, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Let's pick it apart. First, let's see what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying that we have the power to forgive sin and all of its penalties. That would contradict the Bible. If you have been here with us on Wednesday nights, you know we've been studying through Mark. Here's what we learned in Mark 2, verse 5 to 7. It's on your second note page. Jesus, seeing their faith, this was about the paralytic that was lowered down through the roof. You remember that story? Son, he, here's what he said to him. Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Let me tell you something. This is one place where the scribes were right. They knew nobody can forgive sins but God. What they didn't know is that Jesus was God. But they were right to say that nobody can forgive sins but Jesus alone. But you know why? Because only Jesus died for those sins. Only the one who died to pay that sin debt, that penalty of sin, can forgive those sins. And some traditions today, such as Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and some others, 
They have something called confession and penance. It's believed to be a sacrament that results in what they call absolution, where the power to absolve someone, in other words, remove the, the guilt of sin for someone, lies with a priest or a pastor or someone that, that someone might go and confess to. Listen, listen, listen. That is absolute heresy. That is heresy. To think that you can go to a man, confess your sins, and that man has the power to absolve you from those sins. Only Jesus can absolve sins. Here's what we know. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He, Jesus, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who do we confess to? Jesus. He's the one. So what is Jesus saying then? I want you to know in this verse, this complicated looking verse, He's actually speaking about the ministry of the believer. Remember? Saved to sin. He's about to send them out and He needs them to know a few things. Jesus is not talking about absolution here. What He's talking about, church, is proclamation. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador is? It's not a decision maker. A, a, a ambassador is a spokesperson for the one that they work under. That's who we are. We're ambassadors for Christ. We don't have the power to provide forgiveness. We have the privilege to proclaim forgiveness. In other words... We are the ones that get to announce the terms of forgiveness or retaining sin. We get to tell people the truth. You heard me say we get to. It's a privilege. We get to tell people the truth about sin and forgiveness. And that if you will believe in Christ and His finished work on the cross to pay your sin debt and purchase your salvation with His blood, and if you repent of those sins, then your sins will be forgiven by Jesus, making you righteous in the eyes of God because God has told us this is the truth in many places throughout His Word. That if you will call on the name of Jesus, you will believe in the, in the heart, Speak with the mouth that He will save you from your sins. We get to proclaim that. If a person says, well, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe that. Or maybe they might say, well, I don't need to be saved. Then we have the authority of Jesus Christ. He's just given it right here. The authority of Jesus Christ to tell them, you know what then? Your sins remain. Your sins remain on you and you will face judgment if you continue in your rejection of Christ. On the other hand, if you'll believe and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, He will give you eternal life because He will forgive you of your sins. If you reject Him, you'll experience a hellish eternity. That's just the truth. But that's what we've been given. That is our mission, church, to proclaim the gospel. We're saved to sin. Sinned with what? A proclamation. It's a partnership with God. It's where God uses our voices to share the good news and then He does the actual work of redemption in the heart of the one who hears and believes what we've told them resulting in their salvation. A partnership with God. So receiving the Holy Spirit, especially being filled with the Holy Spirit and the ministry of proclamation go hand in hand. As we see some 12 times, you look it up for yourself, anytime you see the filling of the Holy Spirit, remember what that means? To be controlled by. 
Anytime you see the filling of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, and you'll see it 12 times if you look it up, you know what you'll find? In that verse, or the verse right after it, or a couple down, somewhere right in that context, you will find out that they are filled in order to speak. Remember what happened at Pentecost? They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and immediately they began speaking with other tongues. That's just one example. Let's, let's read. I, I put four of them right here, and I'm not going to read the whole verse, but I'm just going to show you just an example. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be what? My witnesses. How are we witnesses? Through our words, right? Through our actions too, but mainly through our words. That's what he's talking about, going into all the world. Acts 4.31, when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What did they do? They began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Acts 9, Acts 9 17, 20. This is talking about Paul out there on that, on that road, remember? Ananias departed and entered the house after laying his hands on him. Brother Paul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me to, that you may regain your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. One more. We read one verse of it a minute ago. We'll read them both now. Ephesians 5, 18 to 19. Do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit doing what? Speaking to one another. And you'll see this the other eight times as well. Anytime you see the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be about making some kind of proclamation. That's why I brought this whole filling up because this is what happens. The filling and the proclamation go together and we're called to go and make the proclamation. You say, well, something I just, I don't know, I, just, I have a hard time proclaiming Jesus. I mean, I just have a hard time talking to people. You know what? Maybe you jumped ahead of the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to be filled first. Ask Him to fill you first, to come in and control you. Then He'll give you the words. He'll give you the, the, um, you know, the, the lack of fear, the boldness. He'll, he'll give you all of that. You'll say the words and you're thinking, I'm just really messing this whole thing up. And He's probably thinking, yeah, you are. But I'm right here with you. I'll, I'll clean it up. Sometimes that's what I think he thinks when he hears me trying to share Christ with people. I'm thinking, God, I'm messing this up. And he's probably thinking, yep, you are, but I told you I'd be with you. And here we go. And he shows up. He shows up. So what we hear, see here in verses 22 and 23 from Jesus, who, listen to me, very important. Jesus, who is about to ascend back into heaven, what we see and hear from Jesus is an act of transferring His own personal mission to His disciples who will still be on the earth and to us because we're the disciples too. You say, well, wouldn't he have done better just to stay here and do this stuff himself? Well, not according to Jesus. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go back to the Father. What's that about? How is it we can do greater things than Jesus did after he goes back to the Father. It's because of the gift that he left us before he went. The Holy Spirit of God. Indwelling us, filling us, controlling us. We're able to go lots of places throughout the whole world. Jesus is pretty much limited. You know, a little 200 mile span there. 40 by 200. And we can go all over the world. We can do greater works, but it's because of the Holy Spirit being inside of all the believers. See, because of this, this is, this is what I call, you know, we talk a lot about the Great Commission. I call this little part right here that we kind of skip over a lot of times, especially verse 22. I call this the Holy Spirit Commission. This is when we were commissioned with the Holy Spirit right here. And because of that, the church now carries the authority of Jesus Christ by way of the Holy Spirit who ensures our success in the mission. 
Again, ours is a proclamation ministry. The judgment of Christ comes from His revelation of light and the response of His listeners when the light is revealed. Each hearer either brings judgment or forgiveness on themselves, depending on their response. So our mission is to continue that revelatory work, to shine that light of truth, the work of Christ into the world. We are saved to sin. Fourth point, second chances, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus. Y'all know what Didymus means? Somebody knows. He's a twin. Thomas was a twin. You ever wonder why you never, never saw this guy? The twin. Never really knew anything about the twin. Who is this twin? Can I just get a little spiritual here? I mean, obviously he had a physical twin. But spiritually speaking, you know who the twin is? We are. Aren't we a lot like Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas. Anybody in here never have any doubts about things? We find our... He was kind of in a low place. Lower than the rest of them. They were all scared. He wasn't even hanging out with them. I mean, I think he thought, good night. If, if they catch them, they'll catch them all. I'm going to lay low. And he was just doing his own thing. He was hiding somewhere. It, aren't we like that sometimes? We're just laying low. We're just hiding, just... Just waiting on Jesus to come back. Just come on back, Lord. You know what I'm saying? We're like that twin of Thomas. But he was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. You remember, you remember back in uh, verse 20? It says the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Well, I reckon they did. This, is the, this was the first time they had seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we... Take that for granted sometimes. But they were, man, they were having a party in this room. And so Thomas, he comes, he, he's not there. And they were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. We were there when a move of God happened, Thomas. But he said to him, listen, this is, this is so important. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, put my finger into the place of the nails, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Did y'all hear that? Y'all not the only ones that heard that. Thomas said that out loud. Look what we read. Now I want, you to, I want you to realize something about Thomas before we move on. Thomas was not one of those rebellious rejectors. He was not one of those in, your, in, in, in the face of Jesus, I just don't believe it. No, Thomas was, he was what I would call an honest doubter. He was just struggling with some doubt. And you know what, Jesus honored his honesty. Verse 26 says, After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. All right, Thomas is here this time. And Jesus came. The doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and here it is again, that theme of salvation, peace be with you. Thomas is about to get a second chance. Don't y'all love it that we serve the God of second chances? How many, how many moves of God have we missed? And God is saying, if you'll show up next time, you can still witness one. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger, see my hands. Reach here with your hand, put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe it. Now, I told you to pay attention to what Thomas said a while ago. Don't miss this. Because Jesus offered Thomas exactly what Thomas spoke. What he said he was going to need eight days ago in order to believe. Here's what I want you all to get a hold of right here. Listen to me. Jesus is teaching here to Thomas. He's teaching here to us that Jesus is always hearing us. Now that can be great and it can be not so great. You remember when you hit your thumb with the hammer what you said? Jesus heard that. But you remember when you were just almost thinking to yourself, Man, 
I just, I just need some kind of miracle right now. You might not even pray for it. Guess what? Jesus heard that too. He heard what Thomas was needing. And he's always with us, even when we don't see him. This is so important to us, because since Jesus ascended back to heaven, we don't get the opportunity to physically see Jesus. At least not yet. It's coming. But we know that he's with us, that he hears us, even though we can't see him. This, these verses right here assure us of that. Verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. I mean, Thomas is all over this thing now. Oh, doubting Thomas doubts no more. You know why? Because this time, Thomas was there when a move of God happened. And he witnessed it for himself, and it changed his life forever. That's what a move of God does. Verse 29, And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But listen, listen. Blessed are they who do not see me and yet believe. That's us, church. Jesus just spoke a blessing on us, church. We believe, though we haven't seen. That's faith from your bulletin. The other front. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. You know what our proclamation message is? It's one of hope and warning. Hope for those who will believe without seeing. Warning for those who reject. That's it. That's what we were told. Verse 29 is here to assure us and is here to bless us. You see, faith sees things that mere human eyes could never see. I don't know about y'all. My eyes fool me sometimes. And the older I'm getting, the more foolish I'm getting, evidently. I'm seeing things that are, you know, popping up. These glasses, they glare, they, you know, and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, my eyes fool me sometimes. But faith doesn't fool us. It sees things that are real, whether the eyes can or not. Verse 30, let's close. Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. You see that? It appears that at that time, that all the disciples were present whenever God was moving. But there were things that they saw that never got written in the book. Verse 31, but these have been written. These, in other words, these things we've just been looking at. These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His, names. The, in his name. The things that are written for us in the Scripture are here that we may believe, resulting in eternal life. You know, one chapter over, John kind of repeats this in a way. He says, if everything that could have been written about Jesus was written, he says, I suppose all the books in the world could not contain it. Have y'all ever thought about that? People ask all the time. People ask me, what do you think it's going to be like in heaven? What are we, we going to do? We're just going to kind of sit around the throne and sing all the time and then, you know, all of eternity? Let me tell you one thing I think we're going to do. I think we're going to spend all of eternity learning all those things about Jesus that didn't make it into the book. There's so much more about Jesus that if it was written down, John said all the books in the world wouldn't contain it. I think we're going to spend eternity getting to know this Jesus even better. It's going to take a while. I'm all right with that. i got a while when I get over there. And then there'll be some other things that go on as well. 
But everything we have here was written so that we can believe right now, resulting in eternal life, so we can get to that point. The purpose of this whole book is to bring people into salvation by faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the beginning point, church. Our salvation. Next week we'll move to step two. Because God's got a plan. And we're going to try to unveil that plan step by step. Colton, just a coincidence, Holy Spirit thing maybe, that you had to sing step by step today. We didn't plan that. But that's what the new year is going to be for us. Step by step, we're going to start seeing what is, why did God leave us here? Salvation was first. What's next? And next and next. Y'all stay tuned with me, okay? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation. Even if we don't make it to another breath, we know that we know that we're going to spend eternity with you because of the price that you paid on that cross to remove that sin debt that would have forever kept us out of the presence of God Almighty. Lord, if there's anyone listening here or by way of the internet or whatever that have never understood that it's sin and we all have sin, some more, some less, but we all have sin, it is that sin, even if we only committed one, that keeps us from the presence of a holy God. And there is nothing that we can do to remove the penalty of that sin. And the penalty is death. Eternal damnation in hell. But you could do something, and you did. You sent us a Savior in Jesus. Went to a cross. Shed His holy, sinless blood in our place, on our behalf, to remove our sin debt so that we could spend eternity with you if we will just place our trust and our faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Not Jesus plus something, but Jesus alone for our salvation. You have promised you will save us and give us eternal life. Lord, help every lost person to hear that message today and fall to their knees before you, Lord, and cry out for your salvation, knowing you will give it to them. Go with us, Lord. Help us to never take it for granted, but to rejoice like these disciples did in seeing the resurrected Lord, that we rejoice every single day in the salvation you have provided for us. In Jesus' name, amen.